the only alternative is to raise interest rates to stop the dollar going down. Now, unfortunately, they would have to raise the rates, not sufficient, if you like, to reward people for a potential loss in the dollar's purchase. They would have to go above that. And in doing that, the effect basically would be to bankrupt the US government completely, because everybody would then see the US government can't afford to pay bond yields of 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 35 percent, which is where it would go to in an unrestrained uh, increase in the quantity of money. So quite rapidly, the US government would find itself in a debt trap from which it just cannot escape. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance and Reluctant Preppers. We have a returning guest who is so appreciated by our viewers that they won't stop talking to me about this man when they call me to find out about how they can protect themselves and their family's finances. This is Alistair McLeod. He's the head of research at goldmoney.com. He joins us again this Wednesday, October 7th, 2020. Alistair, thanks for joining us again. Thank you for asking me, DK. You recently wrote an article about the emerging evidence of hyperinflation. And it is remarkable to me. It reminds me of how uh, when my son was doing research into the, the origins of money and the origins of currency and all that sort of thing, he found deeply conflicting information and we dug it. It took us right down the rabbit hole and that we haven't come out yet. But what I'm trying to get at is the conflicting viewpoints that we have even on the existence of inflation, yet alone hyperinflation. We had Jim Rickards on about a month and a half, two months ago, and he said there is no inflation right now. We have John Williams from shadowstats.com on there saying we've got 8 to 10% uh, you know, real uh, inflation if you, if you factor in the things that are, people actually need to, to do their lives and, and, and take out some of the funny money that business that's happening with our currency. But this one statement at the beginning of your, near the beginning of your article that I wanted to read here right up front to just to set the tone for us. And it also reflects on when we've spoken with Danielle DiMartino Booth, who is a former advisor to the Dallas Federal Reserve, about the role of central banks in general. And this just cuts right into that. It says, the effect of monetary inflation, even at 2% increases, reminding everyone that that's the stated policy as at least 2% inflation by the U.S. Central Bank anyway, the effect of monetary inflation is to transfer wealth from savers, salary earners, pensioners, and welfare beneficiaries to the government. In no way, other than perhaps from temporary distortions, does this benefit the people as a whole. It also transfers wealth from savers to borrowers by diminishing the value of capital over time. If we were taught that in junior high school or elementary school and then reinforced it in high school and so on, we would perhaps come out uh, with the different inputs as in, a, in a republic uh, towards our leaders of our fin financial edifice and say, you don't do, stop doing this uh, programmatic policy targets of, of uh, debasing the currency because it's hurting us. So I guess... Before I go off on a rant about that any longer, if we could get you to bring us to what you see as the key elements of this article that you wrote on the emerging evidence of hyperinflation and what people really need to know um, about what's happening right now and what they can do about it. Well, first of all, uh, inflation in the classical economic sense is purely money. The effect is on the debasement of money. In other words, a rise in the general level of prices. Just for clarification, when you just said money, could I have put the word currency in there to be more yes. specific? I mean, well, currency money, it, I mean, unsound, we don't have sound money. So whatever money we have is unsound. So whether you call it money or currency is actually not all that material. We have what we have, and that is government state-issued money we are directed to use it. We are forced to pay our taxes in it. We're forced to do our transactions in it. We have no alternative but to use the government's money. You can call it currency if you like. <laughs> well, that's the reason we try to do that is to make the distinction in people's minds so that they realize that real money, sound money, is not that, that that's a yeah, debt that's instrument and so on. So, okay, go ahead. 
Yeah, no, I have thought about this point um, in the past. And in the past, I've sort of tended to move towards uh, differentiating between sound money, calling that money, and calling uh, state-issued fiat money currency. Yeah. But I think actually it's probably a little on the pedantic side. Oh, um, right. That's the conclusion I've come to. I'm not necessarily right in that. But um, if it helps people understand the difference by calling sound money money and fiat money currency, I'm very happy to go with that. Yeah, I think it's that gut realization shift that, of reality, that, kind of that reality reset that we're, we're seeking here. So people, our tagline is helping people be aware and prepared, that's that awareness part. It's like, oh my gosh, this stuff isn't really money. <laughs> These flappy yeah. paper bills I've got in my wallet are not actually money. So yeah, exactly. go ahead. But, I mean, even the um, description, the modern description of inflation as being a rise in prices hmm. is misleading because hmm. it's not prices rising, it's the purchasing power of currency falling. Right. And I'll give you an example where this makes um, the way you imagine things very, very different. Um, if, let us say, um, I tell you that the price of uh, dollars measured in gold is going to go to infinity, you think, no, that's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, what's infinity? A million dollars or something for an ounce of gold and more. I mean, this is, you can't visualize that. If, on the other hand, I turn it round and I say the purchasing power of the dollar is collapsing while the purchasing power of gold remains stable, then you can see that. I mean, for example, from uh, 1971 or rather 1968, when the gold pool in London failed to today, uh, the dollar has lost nearly 99 percent of its purchasing power measured in gold. So you can see that, you know, I mean, if we lose another 99 percent from here, I mean, we describe it as either, um, you know, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars or whatever it works out to, or we describe it as it's lost another 99.5% of its value. So I think the way inflation is presented is very, very confusing mm -hmm. for the general public in trying to understand what is happening. And it conceals actually what is happening to money. It is not prices rising, it is the purchasing power of money falling. Now, the reason the purchasing power of money falls is because it is constantly issued there is more and more money pushed into circulation, either in the form of bank credit or in the form of narrow money, which is effectively issued by uh, the Federal Reserve Board. So um, this, all this extra money just sort of, you know, they constantly put it in. And if, if, the, if the banks are not expanding credit because there is a recession or something or they, they've become overextended and they want to... Um, uh, if you like, reduce the risk which they're suddenly aware is in their balance sheet, then the Fed has to turn around. Uh, this is, this is uh, you know, current monetary policy. The Fed has to turn around and replace the contraction of bank credit by expanding the rate of narrow money issuance. And I think that it's important to understand that up until the uh, Lehman crisis, which is what 12, 13 years ago, uh, the rate of broad money expansion was around about 5.8%. Then between Lehman and uh, March this year, there was a further expansion, and that expansion was running at around about 9%. So you can see that this sort of 9%, I think it's 9.6% is actually what I calculated it out to be. So when John Williams says that the rate of price inflation is actually somewhere between eight and 10%. Mm -hmm. You can see how it's more or less marrying up with the accelerated rate of monetary inflation. Um, and you can see how with that accelerated rate of monetary inflation, prices are indeed rising at eight to 10%, not the 2%, which I regard as a gold sort um, to, you know, this gold seeking thing is a thing you do on a spreadsheet. You know, you, mm. you want to know what the answer is. You can predetermine the answer mm. by adjusting the variables. Mm. So, that, you know, basically, um, the uh, statistical authorities gold seek the 2% rate. So it is totally meaningless. And it is extraordinary to me that, uh, you know, highly qualified people in our industry, I mean, when I say our industry, in the financial services industry, 
um, don't seem to realize that actually the rate of inflation is far higher than 2%. They accept what the Fed says. They accept what the Bank of England says. But they know in their own life experience that prices are actually rising far faster. You ask anyone, you know, what's your experience of how prices uh, have changed over the last year? Oh, they've gone up. I mean, obviously, you, you know, they don't sit there and sort of put in a spreadsheet of everything they bought and sort of compare it and all the rest of it, like the Chapwood Index does with... Um, uh, I think around about two and a half thousand items from 50 cities around America. Um, you know, we don't sit down there and compile it. Um, but we know from our own experience, from our bank account, if you like, um, though there are changes maybe in how we spend our money and all the rest of it, but we know that the prices have risen considerably faster than 2%. Mm. And it's interesting that uh, the Chapwood Index, which uses a completely different uh, method from John Williams, comes up with exactly the same answer as John Williams. I mean, I, I uh, calculated the average of the 50 cities, and that's 10.1% on their most recent figures. So, um, but what that tells us is not the prices are rising by 10.1%, but the purchasing power of the dollar, which you use to buy things, has gone down by 10.1%. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, is the first thing that, that, that anyone trying to understand money has to get into their, into their brains. And it's the reason uh, that uh, people like Keynes uh, said that not one man in a million understands um, uh, money or inflation, if you like, um, is he's dead right. Um, but it's actually quite easy to understand once you grasp the idea that inflation actually is of the quantity of money and rising prices or the an increase in the general level of prices is not the prices going up, but a reflection of the purchasing power of money going down. Mm. Why? Because if you double the quantity of money, all else being equal, you're going to harvest purchasing power. So prices rise 100 <laughs> percent. I mean, it's actually not too different from that. So the, the impact of what you're describing here, you bore out with some examples in your article. What do you see as the, how this hits people in their ordinary lives? Well, um, obviously, I mean, if you, can, if you can appreciate that if, say, the quantity of money in circulation is doubled, its purchasing power halves, mm -hmm. if you are paid in that government currency, then your salary is halved. So for a start, you can see that you're losing out from inflation in that way. If you have got money in the bank, in a bank account, its purchasing power halves. So again, you're going to lose that way. If you have got savings, if you're, um, let's say, a retiree and you are dependent on your sa savings and the interest on your savings, the reduction of interest rates to zero hits you. It reduces, it, it means that you, 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 you have to live off your capital and the value of that capital is declining as well. This is no fun. It is very difficult for um, uh, the retirees, the, 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 um, the people, if you like, at the bottom of society, um, the unemployed and so on and so forth, because that's the other thing. If you get a rise in, um, uh, in employment benefit, it's tied to what the government says inflation is. And they'll say it's 2%. And you're damn lucky if you get 2%. Yeah, John um, Williams was saying it's even worse than that. He said that the, the, uh, the calculation of the consumer price index is this target 2% number that they say we haven't been attaining. We'll be, only be getting 1.7 or 1.6 or something like that. So they have to drive it higher now. Um, but he said, but it's worse than that. He says the Social Security uh, cost of living adjustment rate that they use is actually a much more uh, stringent rate that's like three quarters of a percent or something like that they, that they're using as the basis for that. It's, it's even a lower number. It says it's the lowest possible number you could you could ever that's come right. up with. Absolutely. I mean, it's it is actually I mean, it's beyond description. But this is what governments do, I'm afraid. So anyone who thinks that the government is a wonderful thing, just take note what they do with the money. They tax you. Now, the other, the other thing that's interesting in this is that um, uh, the production of extra money is, in effect, a tax on everybody. And it's a tax we don't notice because we don't understand it. The taxes we do understand are income tax, corporation tax, um, sales taxes, uh, you know, local state taxes and all the rest of it. So all those taxes we know. Why? Because it disappears from our money. Now, in many cases, it disappears even before we get our money. Mm -hmm. But at least we do know that we're, we are being taxed. 
You don't know that with, with the production of extra money. And of course, this is extremely useful as far as governments are concerned, because rising taxes or raising taxes unpopular. is generally unpopular. So it's a, coward, you, it's a cowardly stealth tax. Exactly. You can print money and nobody knows. Um, and the rate at which they print money is basically set by one thing at the end of the day, and that is the government budget deficit needs to be financed. Now, in the fiscal year, which has just ended at the end of September, um, we went, or you went rather, from a budget deficit of around about a trillion, that was the target, as it were, just over a trillion, I think, was expected. Then the coronavirus hit, government spending rocketed, they parachuted money into everybody's bank account, um, they spent it on other things, and the result is that out of 6.6 .6 trillion spending, 3.3 of that is funded by taxes, and 3.3 trillion is funded by printing money. So the amount of money that's been printed has just gone off the scale. I mean, it really has. Is that going to change in the current fiscal year? No, because where we are is we can see that the economy is having a second hit from the coronavirus. Businesses which originally hoped, perhaps, for a quick recovery once the lockdowns ended, are now having to deal with the reality that they've probably got too much debt. Uh, input prices are probably rising because the dollar has gone down a bit. Um, and where are their customers? They're not there. So they have got to lay people off. So we're going to see the consequences of the coronavirus actually going far beyond the first shutdown we haven't actually seen that work through the system yet. It is going to go into the second phase as well. So in this current fiscal, new fiscal year, we're going to have a budget deficit, I would think, which would certainly at least match the budget deficit in this year, given that we went from 1 to 3.3 in only six months. When I calculated it out, it was running at an annualized rate of about 4.4 trillion. I can't see how it's going to be any less next year. Now, this creates all sorts of problems. You can print money to finance it, but we've then got to look at the foreigners, which was one of the bones in the article you referred to. The foreigners already own 27 trillion of financial securities and treasury bills, commercial bills, and cash in the banks, 27 trillion. Incidentally, it's probably coincidence, though it's not quite coincidence, there are reasons for it, but uh, the amount of um, debt, uh, US Treasury debt in the markets is 27 trillion. It's almost exactly the same figure. Now, the problem we have is that the global economy has stopped growing because what affects America has also affect, affected every other economy, really. Uh, and uh, consequently, um, they're drawing in their horns as well. Businesses are drawing in their horns as well. So what do you do when things go wrong at home? You basically start looking where you can get financial resources to key up your current position. And guess what? Most of these businesses have got an awful lot of dollars. So they're going to become sellers of the dollars in the foreign exchanges. On top of that, uh, the Fed is going to be doing more and more QE. Basically, the Fed will fund the government deficit. But if it is going to keep interest rates and the yield on bonds, and therefore what the government has to pay at a relatively low level, it is going to have to abs absorb foreign selling of US treasuries, as well as funding this 4.4 potential uh, deficit, budget deficit in the current financial year. So you can see that suddenly, um, uh, you know, having sort of set off on a supply side stimulation, um, you know, sort of back in uh, 2017, 18, um, President Trump now finds himself in the position where that hasn't come back in the form of uh, extra tax revenue. But he's been hit on top of that by the costs of the coronavirus shutdown. And incidentally, uh, we've got another problem, and that is that the banks ha um, are very overextended in terms of their balance sheet gearing because they have been expanding bank credit 
all the way from the uh, aftermath of the Lehman crisis to uh, um, around about the current day. Uh, and uh, if you look at the expansion of bank credit, you can see in America that it is actually beginning to contract. So what does the Fed do? The Fed has got to print even more base money or call it M1, the narrow money definition, in order to keep the whole show on the road. And it doesn't stop there because the basic Fed. <laughs> but policy, wait, there's more. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, there's more. The basic Fed policy is to create the illusion of wealth while they're stealing it from you in the form of inflation. They're trying to tell you that this, your stocks are up, your uh, holdings in government bonds. You know, I mean, OK, we know the yield is is damn near zero. But, you know, if you've been holding government's treasury bonds, then you have enjoyed a wonderful bull market in prices. Um, that is going to continue. You don't have to sell anything. Why? Because the Fed is underwriting the whole market. But the foreigners, again, own Roughly, I mean, I, the, the, it breaks down that, that those trillions, the 27 trillion, it's just under 20, 27 trillion, in fact, but it breaks down to around about 20 and a half in financial securities and around about six and a half in cash, treasury bills and commercial bills. So they're sitting there on portfolio investments, for example, which I think run out about eight trillion, eight, eight and a half trillion, something like that. And on top of that, uh, they've also got U.S. Treasury stock. They've got agency stock. Now, if they start selling the dollar, um, they're going to start selling their securities. They don't just sort of say, well, we've just got a little bit too much cash and we'd better reduce the cash pile. No, they will start selling down their financial securities in the U.S. So, And here is the Fed trying to guarantee that you won't get a bear market, you know, that your wealth is increasing as long as you own your stocks and as long as you hand on, hang on to your US treasuries. They are biting off an awful lot, which they cannot chew. And this latter example, there is a precedent for it, which I think I've mentioned before, and that is what John Law did back in 1720. John Law, Mississippi bubble. He puffed up the bubble because he became the controller of the money. Um, call it the currency, if you like, his livre currency, Thank which you. wasn't backed by anything. And what did he do? He printed it in order to support the share price of his Mississippi venture. What's the Fed doing? Printing money to support the prices of all the financial securities. They are doing what John Law did in a far greater measure. Now, the result of the John Law ex uh, experiment, if I can call it that, um, which it really was, it was the first Keynesian experiment, really, uh, is that um, the peak of uh, the share price for the Mississippi venture was uh, in January 1720. And from memory, it was around about 12,000 livre, livre being the, 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 the currency. The livre had already peaked a little bit. Um, around about November, I think, in, on foreign exchanges. And the interesting thing is that there's a man called Richard Cantillon, who we know in a different context, uh, the Cantillon theory. He described how, um, you know, the prices rose as, as the money sort of went through an economy. Um, anyway, Richard Can Cantillon was an extremely um, able banker, and he never bought into John Law's uh, experiment. What he did, though, he made his first fortune basically by lending money to people to buy John Law's shares and then immediately dump the shares, but was still owed the money, which is, is, is sharp practice. But, you know, he did it and he made a fortune that way. He, he, he sued people in London for £50,000 in the Court of Chancery uh, in uh, 1721, I think it was, to try and get um, his money back from, you know, the ones that hadn't paid. And the courts found in his favour. Uh, anyway. Putting that to one side, how did he play? Uh, how did he make his second fortune out of this John Law thing? Did he short the shares um, at the top? No. What he did was he decided to get rid of the, to to short the currency, which he could do through, through the foreign exchanges. He could short French livre against um, uh, the Dutch currency, the English pound, sterling, whatever. So that's the way he did it. And by October the following year, because he, he was doing this in the tail end of 1719, October 1720, the value of uh, the French livre and the foreign exchanges was zero. 
And uh, there was still value in the shares. The shares still quoted between 2,000 and 3,000 livres. But the point was the livre was valueless. So <laughs> what's the lesson for us today? What's going to happen to the dollar? You know, your shares in um, whatever it might be might still have some value uh, measured in dollars, but your dollars will be worthless. So that, if you like, is the precedent that we can learn from reading about the John Law uh, situation in France exactly 300 years ago today. Oh, my gosh. Um, several things that you've just uh, covered in that story, uh, I wanted to circle back with you on. You were mentioning how the debasement of the currency uh, by printing expanding expanding the currency supply is a stealth tax it's a cowardly stealth tax because it's an it's not admitted as a tax they're saying you know look your wealth is going up uh, by yep. looking at the stock market but meanwhile they're draining out your bank account they're draining out your the value of your of your earnings and your and your retirement and everything like that the other thing that comes with that you mentioned specifically that the debasement of the currency causes a, a nominal price increases in in things that are real yeah. So that then drives a stel another stealth tax, which is inappropriate capital gains uh, taxes, mm -hmm. inappropriate increases in property taxes, in in inappropriate increases in um, uh, payroll taxes, that sort of thing, by, by pushing people up into the next bracket or the next value and making it appear that they've had gains. People are concerned, even when they're purchasing gold and silver as sound money that there will be some windfall tax. Uh, there's already the 28% capital gains tax in the U.S. on collectibles, that sort of thing, but it's, it's on the nominal gains. So you're, mm -hmm. you're being taxed on, on these, these, uh, these ephemeral gains that are actually apparent only because you're measuring in this collapsing currency. Yeah, exactly that. I mean, in, in effect, um, you, you're paying an inflation tax. Uh, on, you know, capital gains tax is an inflation tax. Capital gains tax, if it was only if in a sound money situation, you would find that um, share prices, stock prices would not be inflated by the debasement of the currency. So, um, you know, if you do make a gain by, let's say, buying shares in a company, then that would be a genuine gain. And in that sense, a capital gains tax um, you know, while um, I wouldn't agree with the capital gains tax at all because it, it, it distorts the markets, um, but it is actually a tax on a real return. But the point you're making, which is absolutely correct, is that with everything, with all prices rising because of the extra production of money, the tax actually is a tax on the inflation which the government is creating exactly for without our consent um, exactly. and then the other thing you talked about the zero interest rate policy um, it made me think and I didn't hear it exactly this way from you so I'm going to ask you tell me if I'm getting this when the Fed is ballooning the US debt uh, through this crazy expansion of the of the debt the only way to be able to do that and not just have it immediately blow up on us from being able to service that debt is to keep rates down near zero but by keeping rates down near zero, are they not also making the new bonds unattractive to to potential real buyers and therefore they're painting themselves into the corner that the more that they've had to take over being the buyers, no, nobody and keeping interest rates down, nobody else wants going to want those bonds anyway. Well, ultimately, you're right. But um, in the short to medium term, the Fed controls the prices. So... Um, effectively, what the Fed is saying is we're underwriting the market. So you have no fear that the prices of U.S. Treasuries are going to fall. That's what they're doing in the short term. But as they print more and more money, um, as they expand the quantity of money in circulation, uh, it will debase the money. Uh, the markets and particularly uh, the foreign exchanges will reflect this in a lower dollar rate. Um, you will see the prices of commodities begin to rise simply because there is more money mm. for the same amount of commodities. And uh, uh, at that stage, uh, the Fed will have a problem because um, if it continues on that policy, then it'll just undermine the dollar even more. So what does it do? The only alternative is to raise interest rates to stop the dollar going down. Now, unfortunately, they would have to raise the rates, not sufficient, if you like, to uh, reward people for a potential loss in the dollar's purchase. They would have to go above that. And in doing that, um, 
the effect basically would be to bankrupt the US government completely because everybody would then see the US government can't afford to pay um, bond yields of 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 35 percent, which is where it would go to in um, an unrestrained uh, increase in the quantity of money. So quite rapidly, the US government would find itself in a debt trap from which it just cannot escape. And this was exactly the situation that uh, the Weimar Republic had found itself in uh, between 1920 and 1923. And it was a situation that was uh, accelerated uh, um, by the sort of reparations, if you like, that Germany had to pay. But it wasn't just reparations. I mean, people say, oh, you know, it was, it was the Treaty of Versailles that basically killed the German currency. No, Austria, Poland, Hungary and Russia all had hyperinflations at the same time. And they weren't involved in reparations. Well, Austria might have been a little bit, but you can see how um, really it's when a government decides to finance itself by um, expanding the quantity of money, printing money, inflation, uh, they collapse the currency. That is the eventual outcome. Now, it can take a long time for this to happen. It can happen quite quickly. And that depends on another factor. And this is always the final thing which does for a currency. And that is when ordinary people realize what is going on with a currency, that it is not the prices of goods rising, but the purchasing power of the currency falling they then start dumping whatever currency they have in return for goods they don't immediately need. But the one thing they do is they want to just get rid of money. And that final collapse is was named um, in Germany in 1923 as the crack up boom. I can't remember what the Ger I couldn't I couldn't say what it was in German. I know roughly what it was in German, but I'm not going to inflict that on on listeners. The crack up boom basically is, you know, you've had all this misery. Um, you've had the transfer of all wealth from people. Um, you've had a situation where in Berlin, for example, uh, you could buy in a fashionable area a six bedroom house for one hundred dollars. And one hundred dollars at that time was worth roughly four ounces of gold. That was what happened to the price of real assets in the collapse of the Deutschmark. So this is um, this is a situation where everybody becomes impoverished unless, of course, you've got sound, sound money. If you've got sound money, then you can pick the assets that you want, because the whole point about having money is that it is the temporary bridge between your production, you know, as whether you're a TV star, as you are, or whether <laughs> or whether it's, um, you know, or whether you're a laborer or, or delusional whether... as you are. <laughs> You know, the fact is that you work to earn things which you, you know, you specialize in your production to earn the money to buy the things you don't make for yourself. So it's just a bridge between the two. That's the function of money. And we're about to see a major disruption in that basic function. And when people actually do realize that it is the purchasing power of money that's going down the tubes, uh, then they will get rid of it very quickly. And it doesn't matter what the government tries to do to stabilize it. At that stage, all is lost. So to summarize, the first stage of this tends to be uh, the loss of purchasing power in the foreign exchanges and the loss of purchasing power for um, um, imported materials, commodities, um, semi-manufactured goods, and all the rest of it. The final stage of it is when people really do wake up to the fact that it's the money that is valueless. Get rid of it while you possibly can. And I think when that happens, it can happen remarkably quickly. Um, I think that all, all this phase started in March, um, because on March the 16th, the Fed reduced the Fed funds rate from 1% to zero. On the 23rd of March, which was the following Monday, they had a, an emergency FOMC statement saying, we will print whatever it takes. There was no limit put on QE. And um, quite clearly, that was the start of the hyperinflation. And by that, I mean not hyperinflation in prices. No, remember, inflation is always of the money. So from that point, March, um, we are running to a point at some stage in the future where, where the dollar and any other paper currency following similar 
monetary policies will become valueless. In John Law's case, it took uh, just short of a year. Um, the That final stage where everybody started um, getting out of marks, out of paper marks, um, that was in around about May 1923. By November 23, it was gone. And I think it was on November the 14th. It was fixed back into a new mark, a Renton mark, which was meant to be um, Pari Passu with a gold mark at, um, I think it was one trillion to one or one and a half trillion to one. So you can see that once the slide starts, it doesn't take long to happen. And this is why I think March the 23rd is terribly important. Where we've gone now, I mean, we've seen a massive expansion in uh, in M1 since March. I mean, it's been increasing at the rate of about 60% annualized. And that is just, I mean, can you imagine money supply going up 60% on an annualized basis? This is just, I mean, you know, it's unprecedented as far as the dollar is concerned, unless you go back to the Civil War. <laughs> but uh, this is this is just the start of it. Um, what the Fed is trying to do is going to require a, a multiple expansion of the current quantity of M1, which is around about five and a half trillion dollars. Multiples of that will be produced in the next, I don't know, six months. Multiples. It would have to be because otherwise the U.S. economy will simply collapse. And in fact, this art. I, this particular aspect of it is uh, the subject of an article which I will publish um, tomorrow. It will be released um, sort of, I suppose, lunchtime to after hours uh, uh, Eastern Standard. All right. Well, this video is going to go up uh, Wednesday night in the U.S., so we'll look forward to that that article coming out uh, our Thursday. Um, another thing you mentioned earlier in this discussion was undercapitalization of the banks, which is really interesting because what you said is the banks – are recognizing the risks way ahead of the ordinary person. The ordinary person on the street knows that they've been inconvenienced majorly this year. They know that that they may be laid off. They know, there's some things that are disruptive that are going on in their life, but they don't know that the whole thing's about to blow. Uh, yeah. But the banks pulling in their horns, as you say, uh, are in some cases woefully undercapitalized. And, and you said that that's been driving, that even makes everything worse because First of all, there's the intrinsic risk of that bank failure. We want to talk about that. But secondly, then the Fed or the central bank has to compensate for the lack of uh, money velocity and lack of lending by the banks by, by trying to do other actions themselves to make up for it, which is in a fractional reserve system. If I'm, if I'm getting this, instead of allowing that, that 10x expansion of the availability of of uh, new currency to be happening through the banking system. If it's not happening through the banking system, now you've got to go back to the source, which is the central bank, and you've got to do some huge expansion of that. I think what you yep. call the narrow money supply, which is like is yep. is like really uh, an exaggerated uh, action. It's a desperate action. Um, but could you take us to the the other part of that? discussion, which is about the fragility of the banks themselves. You've sometimes made a list of those which are the most woefully undercapitalized. Okay, all that being true, what does that mean to an ordinary person? What do people okay. need to know about the risk to them, to their family, to their savings of a woefully undercapitalized banking system that's interconnected with each other on the backside with dependencies between banks? Yep. Well, I think the list you're referring to is one I showed in the article we've been talking about. Um, and this is of the GSIBs. These are the global systemically important banks. These are the very big banks which are required under um, local regulations or the um, uh, Basel III regulations to have an extra capital buffer um, so that um, the likelihood of a GSIB failing is reduced substantially in a crisis, which would make the regulators um, a job of uh, keeping a banking system uh, solvent a lot easier. In other words, you know, you, the idea is you've got a you know a bit of a buffer. Um, I would say that generally North American banks um, are not too badly exposed on this basis. Um, I mean, typically you would see that Morgan Stanley's balance sheet is 11.9 times its, its capitalization. Um, if I look at Chase, it's about 9.1 times its market capitalization. So that's not too bad. But when you start looking at uh, particularly the Eurozone, then we've got some banks whose um, market value 
um, is extremely low. I mean, the price to book, which is, if you like, the price of the market capitalization compared with the book value of the equity on the balance sheet. Well, in the case of SOCGEN, Societe Generale, French, big French bank, it's about 15.1%. You know, that's all. That's So in other words, you know, you, you have a euro, a euro on the balance sheet, the market's valuing it at 15 cents. Now, it has risen slightly in the last few days, but, you know, it doesn't it doesn't change anything. So this if you take that into account, which you should, then it gives a balance sheet to market capitalization leverage of over 140 times for that bank. Now, this is quite mind boggling. I mean, other banks um, in the Eurozone, Deutsche Bank, 88 times, um, Group Credit Agricole, 82.7 times. Um, and also another one, which is um, it doesn't look quite so bad, but the share price has really been hit very badly. And that's Santander, the big uh, Spanish bank, which is very worrying. Um, also, uh, if you look at uh, the UK banks, I mean, Barclays, 66.8 times. Um, now, we've got also another problem in the UK banking system because we've got Standard Chartered Bank and Hong Kong Shanghai Bank uh, who do their business basically uh, in Hong Kong and uh, uh, and China. So uh, given what's been going on in Hong Kong and uh, America's uh, determination to um, strangle China's uh, economy, you can see that these banks are falling down a hole in the middle. You know, do they come with the West or do they go with the Chinese? Their business is from the Chinese, but they're regulated in the West. How's this going to work out? So we do have enormous banking problems. Now, moving on to the second point you were asking and how this affects individuals. Um, I think I'm right in saying that in America, there is a deposit protection scheme, which is up scheme to- Scheme is a good word to call that. <laughs> yeah, $120,000 or, or whatever it is. So as long as you have um, less than the maximum of the deposit protection scheme, then your deposits are safe. Okay. Now, I, there is another issue in this, and that is, um, who's actually going to secure it? Well, obviously, um, I think the banks are taxed uh, uh, currently to to do this. They certainly are in this country. Um, the government is, you know, the, yeah, yeah, it would be the Treasury effectively has to pay out on all this. If you have got more than that, then you've got a problem. And you've also got to be careful because if, let us say, you're getting a slightly enhanced yield because you have um, bought, uh, let's say, a, a three-month bond from your bank, bonds are not deposits. Our viewers have heard this, but for those who haven't, when my wife and I, after the dot-com bubble collapse, wanted to protect ourselves, we said, okay, we're not going to let this happen to us again. We moved all of our money out of stocks and into FDIC-insured uh, money market funds yep. at, our, at our brokerage. And then we were getting 0.015% interest. And we, we called up the broker and said, isn't there something we can do to get a little bit better interest on this? Said, well, yeah, we got this reserve money market fund and it has one day liquidity and it's, and it's paying 2%. Said, okay, let's do that. And it's, it's, a, it's a money market. Money market sounds safe-ish. And we went ahead and got that. And then when the global financial collapse happened and Lehman Brothers went bust, we got an uh, email from our broker saying, you will not have access to your uh, money market funds uh, until yeah. further notice. And we said, no, 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 we weren't invested in Lehman Brothers. They said, well, yeah, but your fund was. And so it was collaterally damaged. And so it, FDIC or not, anything that's that's not guaranteed. Now, we can talk about how solid the FDIC is because it gets back to other discussion we had about about the Fed trying to take everything on its back and, and bail out everything and buy everything. But how about that notion that People think, well, I'm I'm not messing around with Societe Generale or any other foreign bank. I'm just I'm just doing good old American banking. So, uh, how is it that people may not even realize they're exposed on the on the backside because of the dependencies that banks have on each other? Well, in international banking, um, the relationships and liabilities between these banks are multiple. I mean. We're talking the dollar is the international currency and therefore big banks have dollar positions. They all have big dollar positions either on their own behalves 
or they have derivative positions. And remember that the total of derivatives markets is something like $800 trillion. And the vast bulk of that is in dollars. So you can see that if you get a failure almost anywhere in the world um, of a substantial bank, there is going to be ramifications throughout the global banking system, simply because all these big banks have very big positions on behalf of themselves and also their clients denominated in dollar accounts. So the idea that, um, you know, Citibank or Morgan Stanley or so on, um, you're quite safe with them. No, they're going to be hit very hard by, say, a collapse of the Eurozone banking system. And we saw this um, back, I think it was in 1932, when uh, the Austrian bank Credit Anstalt collapsed. Uh, the French banks had lent money to uh, Credit Anstalt, which was originally the Rothschild Bank in Vienna going back. And, but, you know, they got into trouble. So two or three banks were put together, you know, like they do nowadays. Two or three of these banks were put together. <clears throat> and there was a sort of scheme of arrangement and they did something with the, with the debt and, you know, recapitalized it. And therefore, the bank was safe, quote unquote. The French banks subscribed for quite a lot of this. Um, as soon as they saw that it was collapsing, they started withdrawing the money and effectively made it collapse through their actions, through their fear. And uh, that developed into um, a banking crisis, which uh, in 1932 was extremely serious. It really was. So, um, uh, But now, I mean, we've got even more uh, international banking. It's a far, far larger part of the global financial scene. So if we get a repeat of the Credit Anstalt situation, which is a dead certainty, in my view, uh, then uh, every banker is going to be affected. And remember, when we talk about just the GSIBs, we're not even talking about uh, the banks which are not on that list, which do not have to have quite such a capital buffer and are probably even more exposed and highly geared to that relationship between total assets and market capitalization. I've been so much wanting to respond to questions I had about things you've been stating that I haven't gotten to our viewers' questions yet. If we can just take a few minutes on viewers' questions, yeah. uh, they'd really appreciate it. You've talked about why you think we have reason for grave concern about the health of the fiat currencies, not only in the U.S., but around the world, and, and that people should really uh, understand that these are not as solid as we're being led to believe that they are, and we should take care of ourselves accordingly. The flip side of that is a question asked by Josh G., said, Alistair, it seems that every time the market has a correction over the past year and many other years that the U.S. dollar rallies big time and gold, silver, and Bitcoin pull back sharply. Should we not have a substantial part of our portfolio in the U.S. dollar based on this reaction? Uh, well, I mean, as I think almost every um, bit of broker's research, not that I'm doing broker's research, says that, um, you know, the past is no guide to the future. <laughs> you know, in other words, they're absolving themselves from what might happen to the share price tomorrow mm -hmm. compared with uh, what has happened in the past. And I think we need to take that lesson actually very seriously when it comes to money as well. What we are talking about is uh, the potential collapse of government issued currencies, which are unbacked by anything other than faith and credit in the government. We are looking at a financial situation which is deteriorating very rapidly now. There is not necessarily a direct link between what happens to um, uh, the economy uh, and uh, the loss of purchasing power of the fiat currency and the price of gold, because the price of gold, as we've seen recently, has really manipulated and it still is manipulated. I mean, we've had big fines against uh, J.P. Morgan. And the amazing thing is, I mean, and criminal charges, mm. even against someone so senior that he was on the board of the LBMA as a representative of J.P. Morgan. I mean, you couldn't believe it. Deutsche Bank, and uh, you know, at one stage, I think just about the largest uh, Eurozone bank, um, shadow of his former self now, also hit by fine after fine after fine for manipulating markets, not just gold and silver, but other markets as well. The spoofing where you, um, uh, you know, you, you sort of go into the market and you let the market know that you're a huge seller, say 5,000 contracts, and immediately the price dips down. So what do you do? You jump in and buy a bit because you sold a little bit of your 5,000 in order to buy it back. Um, I mean, this spoofing is highly illegal. It really is. But they are still doing it. 
I mean, you've only got to look at what's happening behind the scenes in COMEX. All the bullion banks are short. Well, not all, but um, the net short position at the moment is in the order of $36 billion. And this is spread between roughly 27, 28 um, bullion banks. They're known in the market as the swap category. The swaps actually are the bullion bank trading desks. The hedge funds are not um, that much long of uh, the other side of the transaction. But what is interesting is that the other side of the transaction now is increasingly the other reported category, which basically is um, traders who don't fit into any of the other categories, whether it's speculative or non, you know, speculator or non-speculator. These are the guys who are now standing for delivery. They've even stood for delivery in the October contract. And so far, they've taken out 61 tons of, uh, of gold. And that is in a small contract, which is not an active contract. When December comes along, my goodness, they're really going to go for it on previous form. And I've been monitoring very carefully the behavior of the other reported category. And I can tell you that they were the people who went record long of gold futures contracts on the 24th of March, which was the date that the commitment of traders figures uh, was reported. That was one day after the 23rd of March, which, as we've already mentioned, was when the Fed just went, you know, print, 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 print. These guys were record long at the bottom of the market because the gold price had fallen. It had been pushed down by um, bullion banks trying to get their positions back, which they failed, incidentally. The share price, sorry, the price of gold then took off and we had premiums of $95. The arbitrage uh, markets between COMEX and the LBMA uh, completely collapsed. Um, and then you had all these stories about, oh, well, you know, the, the, the mines of closing because of COVID and the, the um, refiners are working, you know, at sort of quarter output because of COVID. and all. I mean, they were trying to find excuses for the collapse. But actually what happened was back in March at that point, which I think is so vital to understand when inflation really uh, takes off, is that um, the price of gold at that stage responded to that and it took off and the whole market basically has become broken. So replying to, to Josh, I think it was, um, I mean, I think the situation now is very, very different from what we've seen in the past. I think that the uh, bullion markets have effectively lost control over the price. Uh, not only that, but increasingly they're being told by um, uh, regulators and so on and so forth, uh, you get caught spoofing, you will be fined. So basically they want out. I think they want out. I think the market is basically in its last uh, last legs. Our apologies. We are experiencing a technical glitch. We lost our internet connection to Alistair. So Alistair, we have you back on audio, I understand? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Well, we wanted to uh, wrap up our interview. We had several more viewers' questions, but since we've lost the video feed, we're going to have to pick up those at a future time. Just wanted to thank you for, I'll put a link to your article we've been discussing about the early signs of hyperinflation, the emerging signs of hyperinflation in the description of this video. We'll look forward to your new article that's coming out tomorrow, Thursday, on goldmoney.com uh, research insights. Is that the right place? Yep, that's absolutely right, yes. And just thank you, as always, for joining us on Liberty and Finance and being here on behalf of our viewers. That's very much my pleasure, DK. Thank you for asking me. To acquire gold and silver, just go to libertyandfinance.com. When the main site comes up, click on Bullion Sales. That's libertyandfinance.com, Bullion Sales. You'll see my name, Donegan Kaiser, my phone number, and my associate, Kaiser Johnson, his phone number, our email, libertyandfinance at protonmail.com.